Hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work for the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and we've got another great show. We do on a nice, warm, steamy day here in Kentucky. Um, we're going to bring you some great um, forestry and wildlife educational stuff. We got Dr. Matt Springer is going to be talking about vultures, kind of continuing some of the work that they've got ongoing. Um, we got Laurie Thomas talking about the ever popular tree of the week. And this one is uh, not only a cool tree, but it's also a food source for me. So we'll learn more about that. Um, and then we're going to be talking about the nurseries, the Kentucky Division of Forestry nurse Nurseries. We have Dr. Laura DeWall. Wall, um, who's been working very closely with the nurseries over the last few years. She's going to be talking about what's going on with them and putting in a plug for getting your tree seedling orders in. So another great show. Thank you all for being with us. If you're on Zoom, you can use the chat pod to interact with us. And if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section and we'll respond appropriately. But glad yeah. to be here, Renee. Definitely. And let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to bring on Dr. Matt Springer to talk a little bit about vultures because there's getting, there's a lot of uh, media attention here lately. I noticed USA Today had some media issue, uh, issues, I guess, with uh, vultures and some problems. And they were trying to fill the voids on um, what's actually going on with that species. And that's what Dr. Springer is doing, right? Yeah, pretty much. And yeah, they had a, a news article uh, last week in USA Today discussing some of the, the negative impacts vultures are having uh, with our producers on cattle uh, and, and slightly mentioning some of the research that's ongoing that, that uh, we are a part of here at UK. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to, to give an update on some of, of the work that we have ongoing here that a, a couple months ago I asked for some help on, uh, and I am going to be asking for some more help next year. We just found out that we're going to try to continue uh, this research uh, with some help from the USDA Wildlife Services uh, through some funding. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to share my screen here. So... Uh, this is really going to, you know, I was going to try to give an update on, on, on the work we have going. Uh, most of what we're doing here at the University of Kentucky is in partnership with USCA Wildlife Services, as I mentioned, but also uh, Murray State University and, and Dr. Andrea DeRock and her lab. Uh, we have a graduate student together that's, that's doing a lot of this work in the field. Uh, I would say about 95% of it, uh, I, and, and he deals with my uh, uh staggering through the woods and, and in barns uh, to help him gather data. So uh, this really comes from, from Phil, who was on the program, uh, asking for help, uh, all his hard work and, and what has come of it. So to kind of refresh, you know, what the project is about is really, um, there's two native vultures to Kentucky. We have the turkey vulture uh, and the black vulture. And there's been a lot of negative press uh, and for, for good reasons. Uh, dealing with black vultures because they are more aggressive. Uh, and unlike the turkey vulture, which is strictly a carrion uh, feeder, so it feeds only on dead animals, uh, black vultures uh, have been documented for decades uh, with the ability uh, to potentially uh, attack and kill uh, animals to feed, which is grown into uh, newborn calves or other cows, uh, bulls that are potentially having health-related issues. Um, obviously, um, producers do not like that ability, uh, because it can have a negative impact on, on their, their, their pocketbook, uh, and their herd and herd health. Um, the problem here is that we, um, we don't know much about black vultures in general. Uh, they were really kind of ignored for several decades. Their, their populations were, were a lot lower than they are now. Uh, and, and it appears that they're both uh, growing in number and expanding their range, which is what the USTA Today article mentioned was they're showing up in places that people had never had to worry about them before. Uh, we're, we were kind of on the northern edge of the range. Uh, and now we're, we're seeing that expand into Indiana, Ohio, and, and even documented now up into Canada. So our goal for the project, for what we're working on, is to actually look at nest success and fledgling survival. So how uh, efficient are these guys at reproducing and adding numbers to their population? Uh, we know almost nothing about that. Uh, so we were tasked with coming up away with a method uh, to both monitor these nests uh, and all as well as catch and tag uh, the juveniles uh, before they fly away from the nest to look at their survival. 
And we had reached out uh, to our extension agents, to the public, uh, to various bird uh, groups uh, to let us know if you know of a vulture nest, because you know this, they are not exactly easy to search for. They uh, traditionally would nest in caves and bushes, logs, uh, and and what we're seeing is you know uh, I'll show you where most of the nests were found is that the they definitely are picking areas out of the way. They're not exactly in your backyard like the robins that we have. Uh, and we were able to find 18 nests, uh, thanks to uh, a lot of public reports, uh, as well as a biologist from the Bowling Green area uh, that works for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, who's been monitoring nests for several decades. Um, and what we got out of this and straightforward, I'm going to jump a little bit to the results here, is, is these guys are very good at hatching their eggs. Um, so we see a 95% success rate at hatching an egg. Uh, a lot of nests and many birds don't even make it to that point. Uh, several, you know, several species, most species fail about half the time to, to uh, nest predation uh, where the eggs don't even hatch. These guys are about 95%. And even uh, stronger here, it seems that we're over 80% success where one of those individuals would fledge. Uh, all the nests had two eggs. So to get one animal recruited on an annual basis like that is, is very uh, successful nesting strategy. And the map here kind of shows where all those birds are located. Um, you know, we have a pretty good distribution. Uh, the bottom left corner there down by where it says Google Earth is the land between the lakes region and Western Kentucky. You can see the Bowling Green. There's a concentration of nests around there in the Green River area in Hart County. And then a few around Richmond and then uh, up into Northeast Kentucky, Mason, Fleming, uh, Robertson County uh, in those areas as well. So what do these nesting areas look like? And it'll give you an idea if you wanna help us out next year, if, if you have some old barns on your property, that's pretty much where about 90% of our nests were found. Uh, they, these birds like uh, old human dwellings, whether that be barns. We also had a couple of abandoned houses or cabins that had nests in them. Uh, and, you know, they, they definitely were, were using these locations. They felt secure in these locations, uh, even despite other occupants that were around. Uh, so this picture of this building is a, a, a prime example of what most of our nest sites look like. And they would um, lay eggs uh, both up in lofts and also down just on the ground, uh, usually in the darkest uh, spot possible that's also dry. Uh, in the in the barns themselves, and if you look there, that that yellow arrow is actually pointing to a chick and an egg that they just drop on the ground. So there's not an actual nest per se, uh, just a nest area. Uh, these guys don't really build any kind of nest structure. They will sometimes grab it, grab uh, gather some some trash, shiny material, and bring it to that nest area, uh, but uh, there's no actual nest structure per se. So. What we actually did once we found these nests is we put trail cameras up so that they were uh, positioned to look down at the nest and, and take pictures as, as often as they can uh, so that we could both ensure that the, the chicks were alive and also um, see what else uh, other animals may be interacting or depredating them. Um, we could catch uh, how much parenting behavior was going on uh, who was doing the parenting, how much um, the uh, adults actually sat on the eggs, um, which can lead to success. Uh, if they're around more, they can potentially fend off or hide their eggs uh, better from predators. Uh, so this continued all the way through until the birds basically flew away. Uh, as you can see in the bottom right corner there, that's a, a chick that is uh, starting to get its adult plumage, uh, is definitely a lot more active. Uh, when they got to this size, it, it was not uncommon for them not to be in the area where they were born for very long. They would use the entire structure uh, and explore it uh, both uh, on the ground and vertically uh, if they could. Uh, and then they would also try to hide. And a lot of times we would have a hard time finding them when we would go check on these cameras. Uh, even though we knew they were there, they would hide in a corner and not move and not make any, any noise, uh, which... Um, made life a little more difficult for us in some ways, but also a great survival strategy for them. So some of the more interesting pictures and what we found out is, um, as many of you can imagine, these, these buildings and human dwellings 
uh, are not just vulture habitat, but um, very much occupied by uh, some other common wildlife that most folks uh, end up running into problems with, which are things like raccoons, uh, which is one of our top nest predators for all birds, uh, including larger birds, as they are very happy to consume as many eggs as they can find. Um, which is one of the things that was very striking to us is that, you know, vultures are actually selecting for areas that constantly have raccoons in them. So there must be some kind of, of um, defense strategy they have in place to, to keep raccoons away. And, and that was very much the case is these guys were, were observed um, standing their ground against raccoons uh, as well as possums and, and other uh, mammal predators. So we continued monitoring these nests. We have a whole bunch of pictures and, we're, and from those pictures, we're able to calculate survival. And um, that kind of took us to the next stage. So as these birds grew and, and they got their adult plumage, we had to find a way then to monitor their survival as they progress from being a fledgling, which is basically a bird that's just left the nest to becoming an adult that can reproduce in the population. So we had to actually, um, part of the grant was to, to use a GPS backpack and place that on the bird to, to monitor its movements and survival after it leaves that area. And in order to put that backpack on the bird, we had to catch the birds. Um, and at this point, when, when the backpack um, weighs just about 40 grams, um, it's meant to stay on the bird for up to four years. Uh, it'll continue to collect locations. Um, but it has to be less than 3% of the bird's body weight so that it does not affect their movements and survival. Uh, so we were kind of waiting for the, the fledglings to get enough weight on them to put those backpacks out. At that point in time, these birds were capable of not only branching behaviors where they can bop around on, on the, in, you know, uh, in the loft, on the beams there in the loft, but also would actually make short jumps out to trees outside of the barn. So catching them is a um, proved to be a challenging ordeal. Um, it's fairly complicated, and it really involved us using uh, basically big fishing nets and and trying to get birds in positions that we could catch them with those fishing nets. Uh, the other thing that I personally found out is that these birds are very good at running, uh, which involved one nest involved me running them down or chasing them through a road. Uh, they can get uh, to top speeds over 20 miles an hour. Uh, even though I'm not as fast as I once was, I'm, I still would not catch them even if I was younger. Uh, so there was a little bit of strategy involved in how we caught these birds, but we were able to successfully catch and deploy 10 of these backpacks on juvenile vultures. And really all it does is, is it sits on, on the, in between the wings on the back uh, with a harness material. Um, which involved us holding the bird and basically we then would, would put a hood over the bird to lower its stress levels. Uh, in this picture, we kind of took the hood off because it would block the, the image uh, of the backpack. So otherwise the bird would have been hooded uh, and un unseen. Um, but someone would have to restrain the bird while two or three other people worked to put that backpack together. Uh, once the backpack was on, which took about two to three minutes, we then took that bird and placed it uh, back into the nest location. Uh, and usually the birds were more than happy to go running away from us uh, as quick as possible. Um, so what we found out here is that um, so far so good on these backpacks, they've, they've maintained um, both you know, operation and the birds haven't, haven't destroyed them. Um, so as you can see, that bird went running back in there and is happy to get away from us um, as we were of them. They were, they were not fun to work with, to be honest. Um, so, um, but what are we getting from these backpacks? Well, um, here's a couple of images and all these red dots are actually the locations of that bird uh, over a course of a couple of days. So the, the top left is one, one individual um, and these locations, basically uh, there's a, a solar panel on that backpack. So we can get upwards of 400 locations a day where uh, if they don't have great sun, so if they stayed inside the barn a little bit longer, we get a little bit less locations, but we still see that these birds are fairly tightly tied to that nesting location, even after being able to fly for a month or two, that they return uh, quite frequently to that area and feel safe there. Um, 
so we're going to continue basically to monitor those birds. Um, we still actually have two nest sites that are active right now that haven't fledged yet. So we're still waiting on those. One of them was a, a nest failure that they actually re-nested, which is a fairly uncommon thing for this species. Um, and then we're going to continue to use this data that we're, we're getting in on, on the locations uh, of these individuals and, and start asking questions, not only about the survival of these animals, but how are they using the landscape, especially as it relates to um, that conflict that we have with producers. Uh, are they starting to target and, and frequent areas that would, we would expect to have cattle present potentially having calves. Um, and we're gonna, you know, we just got word, like I said, from USDA Wildlife Services to do another field season uh, and hopefully collect a, 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 a good bit more data on, on nesting ecology of these birds. We have a lot of questions as it relates to individual weight gain. Uh, There's always one chick that was larger than the other one. Uh, so are the adults favoring certain chicks, which is pretty normal, but we don't know if they do it. Um, trying to mark the adults to see if there's uh, parental behavior that's interesting. So is the female or male doing most of the work in terms of feeding them? Um, so it, we're excited for it. Uh, we think there's gonna be some real good um, implications for uh, applied management of the species and, and hopefully something that we can eventually wrap around to giving producers uh, some more uh, potential tools to deal with the conflict. With that, I will be happy to take any questions uh, as it relates to, to uh, the project or vultures in general. Thank you, Matt. We greatly appreciate that and you doing that presentation. And, you know, we've got a question about this too, but turkey vultures, black vultures, what's the difference? So uh, completely different species. Um, the, the bigger difference uh, that people care about is turkey vultures tend to... Um, be less aggressive, not only towards, um, you know, that they'll only eat dead animals, but they also don't cause problems uh, around buildings and structures. Black vultures will tear apart roofs, shingles, uh, rubber uh, associated with motorcycles, cars, boats. Uh, so we don't see any of the problems um, with the turkey vultures like we do with the black vultures and that destructive behavior. And, and we're, there's a hope that it's actually like two individual populations where you have a, a, a vulture demolition gang that hangs out in the urban areas. And then you have the ones that are, aren't really causing too many problems uh, because that would make management a little bit more uh, straightforward. Um, but uh, I, I don't have my hopes too high on that. So do both of those turkey and black vultures nest in barns or abandoned houses? So we did find two turkey vulture nests that were reported as, as, as vulture nests, basically. We, they, they weren't sure. Um, and one of them uh, was found in a barn. Um, and it only, um, it basically was in an area that was surrounded by black vultures uh, and it hid itself away more so than, than most of the other vulture nests. Um, and then we also had a turkey vulture nest that was very similar to the black vulture nest in an area that had a lot of black vultures around. Uh, so we don't know. It, there's some questions related to our black vultures out competing the turkey vultures for the better nesting sites. Uh, and that's something that we're interested in uh, and may also kind of point to why black vultures or populations seem to be increasing uh, relative to turkey vultures. Uh, so there may be competition at many levels uh, of their life cycle. So the next question is, do black vultures prey on other live animals such as fawns? So they can, they, they can prey on whatever live animal they can catch. Um, so they will go upwards of a cow uh, if they can get it cornered to the place that they can run it down. And usually these are not an individual depredation event. It's usually multiple vultures that are seemingly working together to uh, achieve a, a goal of, of, uh, of dinner. Uh, per se. <laughs> um, yeah. But naturally, they would they would chase down rodents. Um, it's been documented that they would, you know, follow folks that are cutting hay in the fields to look for the injured rodents that may have got caught in the mower. Uh, fawns would be the same thing, I would imagine. Uh, it They do seem to have it a lot easier to find cows based on cow calving behavior, right? Um, most deer will go away and, and kind of find um, a quiet, undisturbed location 
uh, to have their fawn uh, because, you know, there's multiple predators outside of vultures, whereas uh, cows um, don't, don't tend to have access to those locations, nor do they, um, you know, they're a rather bit large animal. There's not too many things that they would have to worry about. Interesting work, man. It really yeah, is. Definitely. Yeah. How long do those backpacks stay on the vultures? Well, we're told that they'll work for up to four years. Oh. Um, so, and vultures are a very long lived species um, uh, over 20, 25 years. So we're hoping to get a lot of data to, to fill in the front end. We're the first ones to ever put them on fledglings. Uh, so um, there's a, Purdue's got a few on adults, but we're the first ones to ever put uh, backpacks on, on black vulture chicks, basically. Uh, yeah. So it's all, it's all new, yeah. which is well, it's fun. I was going to say, hopefully their buddies don't pick the packs off of each I, other. <laughs> I, I lost some sleep over that one, Billy. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> So far, hey, so good. <laughs> hey, well, you're on the cutting edge of science here, Matt. So yes. really neat. So we'll definitely have you back for another oh, yeah. year on that in about a year. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Cer yeah, certainly of interest to a lot, especially in our agricultural community. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, away from vultures. Right. And tree of the week, Lori, thank yes. you for joining us again. Hey, how's everybody doing? Doing good. well. So this week I, I picked a, a very tasty tree. It's one that I really love because pecans are probably my favorite nut. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a, um, a member of the hickory family and it is it natively is really only found in the far western part of our state, but it's been planted all across the state because people like pecans. So they'll plant them and if they have a large enough um, site or landscape, they'll plant one of those because it is a big tree. So here, learn a little bit about pecan. Wonderful. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the pecan. Pecan, Kiri illinosis, is one of the better known hickories. It is one of six hickories found in Kentucky. Pecan is also called sweet pecan, pecan hickory, and soft-shelled hickory. It is a large, long-lived, deciduous tree. Trees typically grow 100 to 150 feet tall and up to 6 to 7 feet in diameter. It has a large irregular crown with ascending branches. Pecans are grown commercially in the southern states and it is the most important nut species native to the United States and there are numerous varieties and cultivars of this species. Pecan is also an excellent multi-purpose treat for the right home landscape since it provides a delicious source of edible nuts for both humans and wildlife. Pecan's natural range is in the lower Mississippi Valley and extends west into eastern Kansas and central Texas and south into northern Mexico. It is only found in the far western part of Kentucky. Pecan grows on well-drained loam soils. It does not typically grow in soils that are subjected to prolonged flooding. Its best growth is on riverfront ridges and well-drained flats. Pecan is shade intolerant, in fact the least shade tolerant of the hickories and the fastest growing. Pecan is a deciduous tree with relatively large pinnately compound leaves. They are described as pinnate because a row of leaflets forms on either side of the leaf stem called a rachis. They are similar to a feather. The leaves are alternately arranged on the stem, about 12 to 18 inches long, with 9 to 15 curved leaflets that have finely serrated margins. The leaflets are typically, but not always, oppositely arranged on the rachis and fall leaf color is a kind of a golden coppery yellow. This species is monoecious, which means a tree will have both male and female flowers. The male flowers are in four to five inch hanging yellow green catkins, usually in groups of twos or threes. The female flowers usually occur singly or just a few at the end of the new growth on the branches. Flowers bloom in early spring and they are wind pollinated. Pecan fruit is an egg or sphere-shaped nut about one and a half to two inches long. The nuts are enclosed in a thin husk that dry at maturity and split away from the nut along four seams. The fruit is initially green and turns brown to black as it ripens in early fall. Trees begin seed production around 20 years in a natural setting but can begin production at two to four years in some cultivated trees in plantations. Maximum seed bearing age is about 300 years. Trees have good seed crops every one to three years, and the seeds are dispersed by water and animals and germinate the following spring. 
The bark is smooth on young trees. On mature trees, the bark is a light brown to brownish gray, and it's divided into interlacing, somewhat scaly ridges with narrow fissures. The heartwood of pecan tends to be light to medium brown with a reddish hue, and the sapwood is a pale yellowish brown. It is generally ring porous to semi-ring porous with large to very large early wood pores, that's the wood formed in the spring, in a single intermittent row, and medium to small late wood pores, wood that's formed later in the growing season. Tylosis is common in the pores. Pecan wood is considered non-durable to perishable regarding heartwood decay and is also susceptible to insect attack. Pecan is considered one of the hardest and strongest of woods native to the U.S., along with many other hickories. Pecan is an important wildlife tree where present in its range. The fruit provides food for a variety of wildlife, including woodpeckers, chickadees, cardinals, blue jays, pine and yellow rumped warblers, fox, gray squirrel, and raccoons. White-tailed deer browse the foliage, and pecans also provide cover for birds and mammals in the oak hickory forests. Pecan is also the larval host tree for the luna moth and the hickory horned devil. Like most adults of the giant silk moth family and the regal moth family, they do not feed and only live about a week. The wood of pecan is used for furniture, cabinetry, paneling, pallets, and veneer. The wood has a high thermal energy content when burned, so it's used for fuel wood and for smoking meats. Pecan is prized for its tasty nuts and is extensively grown in the south and abroad for nut production. The nuts are used in pies, cookies, candies, oils, and for snacking. The trees are also planted as an ornamental and can make an attractive landscape tree both visually and for wildlife where space permits since it grows quite large. Like most nut-bearing trees, it has a well-developed taproot and can be difficult to transplant. The national champion pecan, as of 2021, is in the Isle of Wight in Virginia. It is 293 inches in circumference, 97 feet tall, with a 106-foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion pecan, as of 2021, is in Fulton County. It is 216 inches in circumference, 106 feet tall, with a 112-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees, or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about pecan. Pecan was named the State Tree of Texas in 1919. The United States is the leading producer of pecan nuts, producing approximately 75% of the world's pecans, and we celebrate the pecan with the National Pecan Day on April 14th. Pecan is from the Algonquin word pecan and refers to any nut that required a stone to crack. Alabama and Arkansas named the pecan their official state nut, and California included pecan as one of the four state nuts. Native Americans used pecan to make a treatment for ringworm and a decoction from the bark to treat tuberculosis. The scientific genus name Caria is from the Greek Caria, the name that's applied to the walnut tree, and the species name Illinosis means from Illinois. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, a local park, or neighborhood, and enjoy the many wonderful native trees of Kentucky, including the pecan. Well, Lori, we greatly appreciate you doing sure. that for us. And um, I was wondering, um, do people grow uh, pecans uh, commercially in Kentucky? They do. There, um, there are a few pecan orchards um, in the western part of the state. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times they'll be mixed in with other, they'll, they'll just be a nut orchard. So they'll have some pecans there, but there is like the, um, the kite pecan orchard in um, Western Kentucky. So they strictly grow pecans, but it's not as in this, it's more in the South. Um, Georgia, Texas, and New Mexico are our top producers of pecans um, for the United States, but we do grow some here too. Oh, interesting. Oh, it's one of my favorite nuts. I love that. Oh, I know it's I good. Know. I saw the praline pecans. I'm like, oh, I buy those. I, <laughs> that I was like, man, I wish I had some right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, Laurie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Making us uh, hungry. Uh, no. oh. right. Well, thank you greatly. We yeah. appreciate it. Cool tree. Thanks. Right. Appreciate that series yeah. for sure. Yeah.
Oh, very cool. Yeah. You know, moving on, <laughs> Billy. Yeah. <laughs> staying in the tree realm, you know, but um, a lot of times, you know, we hear woodland owners that say, well, I want to plant trees, but I don't know where to get seedlings from. I don't know what to do. Um, and so we're going to try to help them with that. Yeah, we're certainly blessed to have a great um, Kentucky Division of Forestry and um, Dr. Laura Dewall is with us today and um, she works really closely with the nursery. So, Laura, what's going on? Hi, everybody. Um, Charlie Saunders, who normally would do this segment for us, is busy with the state fair activities. So um, he sends us apologies and he hopes everyone will order seedlings. <laughs> so I'm going to just give a little talk in his place about that to make sure everyone knows what to do and how you can get seedlings. Wonderful. All right. So um, in case folks don't know, the Kentucky Division of Forestry has two nurseries. I'll show you a map on the next slide. But one is the J.P. Rohde um, Nursery over on the western part of the state. And the, on the eastern side, we have the Morgan County Nursery. Um, both have been in operation for about 50 years. And they were actually strategically located in these two different places because they wanted to be able to ship the seedlings um, from the nursery to the customer so that you could get it in one day. Um, the sooner you can get it from the nursery to the planting site, the better. So um, that's why they, in addition to things like soils and stuff like that. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to the KDF Morgan County Nursery because they are partnering with the White Oak Genetics and Tree Improvement Pro Program. And they are essentially growing all of the seedlings for the project for us. And so if it were not for their help, we, we, there's no way we could do the project. So I spent a lot of time out at Morgan County, but the, um, the, JP, the John P. Morgan Rody, ah, John P. Rody Nursery in the western part of the state is also lovely. Um, the nurseries produce over 1.1 million seedlings per year, and they can offer as many as 50 different species. So sometimes the number of seedlings they have and the number of seedlings they have per species and the number of different species depends a little bit on the seed that they're able to obtain. Um, and both nurseries are actually working on creating seed orchards for different species, which will help them um, grow more species on a regular basis. So basically, the uh, seed, depending on the species, is either planted in the fall or the spring, and the seedlings are grown um, until they're dormant, which, in which case then they're lifted with this big machine. And they're put into cold storage because um, uh, they're, they're lifted when they're dormant because they can handle all of the, the handling that happens with that, and they're wrapped up, and they're, they're shipped out when they're dormant because, again, this is when the seedlings can handle all that and still survive. And so the orders are shipped out in early spring, which is when the seedlings are still dormant, which is also the best time to plant. So now is actually the time to put in your order because the seedlings will, um, the nursery will run out of different species. So even though you won't actually get the seedlings until the spring, uh, you do wanna plant or you do wanna get your order in now. So this map shows the different field office locations as well as the two nurseries. So you can see over there in Gilbertsville, that's where the John P. Rohde nursery is. And then over um, in West Liberty, which is where the Morgan County nursery is. And so I spent a lot of time over there in Morgan County. And then below is some contact information for the different um, field offices. And I won't spend any more time on that because the same map with the same information it's actually available on the order form. So where do you go to get information about the seedlings? So if you wanted to put in that entire uh, URL, that's the yellow highlighted, that will take you directly there. Um, and in a moment, I'll actually um, go to this website and show you. Or you can actually type in the next one, which is a little bit shorter. And then you can scroll down to the state nursery and seedlings link. Or if you can't remember that, you can actually go to the Energy and Environment Cabinet homepage, which is the um, division that the forestry division, the Kentucky Division of Forestry is in, in terms of the state government. Um, but to be honest, I can never remember any of those. So I just go to my um, Google search engine and type in Kentucky Division of Forestry tree seedlings. And that'll pretty much take you right there. So once you get to the web page, um, we'll, we'll take a look at some things. One is the order form. 
they also have this really cool species descriptions and fact sheets that I think a lot of people are not aware of. And then um, they also have a really nice summary of, of planting instructions. So let's take a look at the order form first. You all are getting the very first look at this. This is actually not up on the website yet. It, it should be there by Monday for sure. Um, and definitely by September 1st, which is when you can start placing these orders. So you guys are getting the first look at it. So September 1st is when you can start ordering. And I wanna point out that you, you place your orders actually with the nearest local district office, not the nursery. So what happens is the orders come in to the different field offices, and then they work with the two nurseries to figure out what's going to come from where. OK, so the local offices can also answer questions. Um, and if they don't know the answer to your question, they can um, th they'll talk to the nursery supervisors um at the different nurseries and that's jason powell at the macon county nursery or joanna davidson at the john p Rody nursery and i want to point out that there is a cost to the ceiling but shipping is free and again the idea is once the ceilings are shipped from the nursery you should be able to get them the very next day so this is zoomed in on on a, on a part of the order form and it shows the different species they have available and again they they update this every year which is why um you can't just pull up an old order form. They'll pull the order form off as soon when ordering is done for the year. So it shows you all the different species they have available. And I, I want to point out that the species with the red asterisks or kind of orangish, whatever color that is, those are actually larger seedlings. And because they're larger, they cost more for KDF to ship. So they, they do cost a little bit more. Um, but if you notice at the bottom, still, you know, you're looking at if you have a bundle of 10, you know, you're looking at $4 per seedling, which is really, really inexpensive, actually. And so if you think about all that's happened from when that seed was collected to being grown in the nursery and and then shipped to you for free, um, it's, it's actually really still a really good deal. I do want to point out the nurseries do run out of species that are in high demand. So, for example, white oak is always in high demand. And the nurseries always run out of white oak. So it's best to place your order now. Um, and then that enables you to basically reserve the species that you want. So this is the back side of the order form. And again, if you're not sure where your uh, branch office is located, it's got all the contact and information um, there. And so again, that's actually where you go to place your order. All right, so I'm going to... This is what the um, State Nursery and Tree Seedlings page looks like. And again, you can see here in the center where it says they're no longer taking orders, um, but that will change as soon as they post the new um, seedling link. And again, here, over here on this side, they've got seedling descriptions and fact sheets. And then underneath there, they've got a PDF document that actually is really good about how to plant. So this is a really useful page because, you know, I know Lori's done such a great job with the tree of the week. And um, so you can also, you know, so you can look at that, but then they've got these um, each for each seedling. It talks about what the seedling is. It gives you a picture of their leaf and their bark and their, what the seed looks like. Um, so for hazel alder, for example, and again, they, they list basically these fact sheets are for the, all the species that, the nursery actually has for sale. So if they don't have the particular species, it, it won't be listed here. So here's what a typical um, plant fact sheet would look like. And it just steps you through. So again, this is that's a great resource for you. Um, so anyway, that's that's what it's all about. It's time to order your seedlings. I know it seems early to think about what you're doing in April of 2022, but <laughs> this forces you to be a little bit organized, I guess. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah it, 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 I was going to say, it's an amazing resource that we have here in Kentucky, and I really encourage folks that are interested to take advantage of this. As Laura mentioned, I mean, if you consider what goes into the production and the shipment of those seedlings and that minimal cost, it's a great deal, it really is. Well, and I'll, I'll point out that, you know, 
if you want one tree for your yard, you're better off buying that from a landscape nursery because you'll actually get a tree, you know, that will be big, right? Um, so the these seedlings are really for those folks interested in, in reforestation and in planting their land, for example. And, and that's actually the, the, the role behind the nurseries is actually for reforestation. You, you know, and along with that, you can work with your forester and they can help you select seedlings for your site. Um, you know, not every site is um, supportive of every tree seedling or at least to the same capacity. So matching the right tree with the right site, your foresters can help you do that. They can also loan equipment sometimes. They have some tree setters um, that you can pull behind a tractor so you can make really tree planting really quickly and they can provide assistance. There's also some call share assistance available for tree planting um, through the Natural Resource conservation service as well as local um, call share programs through your conservation districts or the state call share program. So working with your forester can not only get you the right seedling for your place but it can get you the help you need and maybe help cover some of the calls. So work with your foresters. That's always a good thing. <laughs> All right well thank you Laura we appreciate you being on today. Yeah yeah thank you and um, we'll tell Charlie you did a great job. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All well, right. So, but we're not done. This we're not. Is the last Wednesday of the month. And as promised, we are going to talk about our upcoming programs. Yes. Uh, and Renee, we've got a number of upcoming programs. So I'll go ahead and share that with the, the group right now. All right, so we're going to talk about the upcoming September programs, and there are a number of them. Really, this whole fall is kind of jam-packed with programs, mm -hmm. so um, let's talk about what's happening next month in forestry and natural resources programs. Let's start with one that really starts on September 3rd, but continues all the way to December 17th, and that is our Kentucky Master Naturalist Training. So um, Dr. Ellen Crocker and Laurie Thomas are managing and, and coordinating this program. So on Fridays at 10 a.m. via Zoom, they're going to have some awesome presentations and covering a wide variety of topics to get you trained as a Kentucky Master Naturalist. So there is a $100 registration fee for that, and you can click check it out by the, following that link there it's also on our calendar page as well so you can check it out there but again that starts on september 3rd and runs through december 17th a great opportunity to get a lot of great information all right moving on to september 14th we have a series of four upcoming maple syrup workshops this fall and this is the very first one and it is going to be via zoom as well september 14th this is an evening program and it's going to run 7 to 8 30 eastern time and we're going to be basically talking about the maple syrup, syrup opportunities here in kentucky um, we're also going to be hearing from the kentucky department of agriculture renee believe it or not there is a maple syrup um, competition where you can win a blue ribbon if you will at the state fair for the best maple syrup. So um, we're going to be talking about those results as well with uh, Miss Kimberly. I think we need to try that out. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be judges. <laughs> yeah, it's really sweet. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Um, all right, and then moving on to um, September 17th and 18th, we have the um, Kentucky Wood Expo. So this is actually put on by the Kentucky Forest Industries Association, um, but our entire forestry and natural resources extension, or extension team um, puts in a lot of time and effort to try to help make this a success. Um, so join us there in Lexington. It, it, these programs run all day, basically 8 to 4.30 um, on Friday and Saturday. That's September 17th and 18th. So there's there's going to be a lot of really cool equipment there. There's going to be a lot of displays. Um, they have craft materials. We have demonstrations. There's some logging, um, or not logging, but some like um, um, lumberjack competitions going on. So just a lot of stuff to see and do. Our very own Bobby Ammerman is going to be there, um, and you'll have a chance to make your very own cutting board um, as part of this program. So please join, and join us at the Kentucky Wood Expo um, September 17th and 18th. Um, all right, moving on to the end of the month, September 28th and 29th. As of now, um, the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association is planning to do this person in meeting, but I do know that they are contemplating um, canceling um, or rescheduling because of COVID concerns. So um, if you are planning to go to this, please stay up um, on their website to find out what's going on um, with that latest on that. Um, but if it is happening, I strongly encourage you to think about joining this group um, or at least checking 
checking it out and attending their annual meetings to see what they're doing because they are doing a lot um, for woodland owners across the state. So that's a good opportunity. And a number of us are going to be down there, including Dr. Ellen Crocker, Dr. Jacob Moeller, uh, as well as myself, um, trying to interact with that group if it happens. <laughs> um, and then um, our series of the From the Woods Today, we've got another long month of five programs. So we're excited about that. We're gonna start off September 1st um, with part three of Dr. Jacob Muller's Intrigue series. So we'll find out um, who he's talking to and, and what they're talking about in forestry work here in Kentucky. And then we're gonna have our Chad Nyman, our very own Chad Nyman that is, um, we're gonna be talking about small scale logging. And um, we just had our Woodland Owner Short Course at Robinson Forest, and they put on a great demonstration of some of that equipment that's available. So if you have an ATV or perhaps a tractor, there is some equipment that will allow you to move some logs around your property uh, much more efficiently and a lot safer. So it's a chance to kind of learn about that. And then we're going to be having a show about the Wood Expo on the 15th of September. Um, so you can kind of get a preview, if you will, of what you can see there on um, September 15th. And then on September 22nd, we're going to be talking about monarch tagging. Believe it or not, they actually tag butterflies. So we'll learn how that's they do. Be interesting. I we'll know. See yeah. how that's done. We saw Matt putting uh, backpacks on vultures, so I guess you right. could put tags on butterflies. So um, exactly. we'll make sure you join us to see how that works out. And then we're going to be talking about woodland management practices, some of the common things that we do in our woodlands to try to achieve whatever goals you have for your property on September 29th. So a big lineup of shows joining, join us each week um, on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah, we always look forward to um, all of our uh, panel guests and people coming in and we also look forward to you all you know if it wasn't for you all we wouldn't have a show so we greatly appreciate you joining us each week and um you know billy if anybody wants to re-watch one of our shows because I, I mean if you're like me you're you, you're yep. busy and then you were like oh what did they say i can't quite remember um you can always go to from the woods today.com Yep, and you can see all of those as well as many of our other videos that we have are on our YouTube page. So again, you know, if you wanted to watch all of our videos, you better set aside a couple weeks. Um, exactly. We have a ton of content on there, really. And as always, reach out to us if you'd like to see something on the show. We have a little survey form that you can complete on fromthewoodstoday.com and let us know what you'd like to see on a future episode. Definitely. You know, but I think that's all we have for today. But we greatly, again, we greatly appreciate you all joining us and we couldn't do it without you. So uh, make sure you join us again next week uh, at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. Take care. Bye, Bye. everyone.